very good morning uh, all of you i am dr mc nataraja working as a professor in the department of civil engineering at ramaya institute of technology msrit bangalore welcome to session 1 i will be teaching you the design of steel structural elements 18 cv 61 this is for semester 6 of bachelor of engineering in civil engineering of vtu under choice based cad system and outcome based education so let me have the pleasure of uh, introducing to the course learning objectives as far as this particular subject is concerned so this course will enable the students to understand advantages and disadvantages of steel structure steel code provisions and plastic behavior of structural steel this is the first objective as for the second objective is concern is to learn bolted connections and welded connections the third objective is to design the compression members built up columns and column splices the fourth objective is to design the tension members simple slab base and cassetted base and uh, the fifth objective is to design laterally supported and unsupported steel beams so these are the learning objectives as far as this particular subject is concerned now coming to the outcome of uh, this course after studying this course students will be able to possess knowledge of steel structures advantages and disadvantages of steel structures steel code provisions and plastic behavior of structural steel in fact uh, i'll be discussing uh, on this particular issue which comes under the module 1 as a part of the remaining uh, objectives the student should be able to do the understanding the concept of bolted and welded connections and to understand the concept of design of compression members built up columns and column splices the fourth uh, outcome is the student should be able to do at the end of the course to have an understanding of the concept of design of tension members simple slab base and cassetted base understand the concept of design of laterally supported and unsupported steel beams now coming to module 1 the content of the module 1 is to have the introduction to the module itself wherein the advantages and disadvantages of steel structures will be discussed in greater detail limit state method limit state of strength structural stability serviceability limit states the different failure criteria of steel design considerations loading and load combinations as discussed in the course of practices is code provisions specifications and section classification or the important things uh, which to which i will be introducing as a part of this module after this the plastic behavior of structural steel will be taken in greater detail and little bit of introduction to the plastic behavior of steel structure then the importance of plastic theory the concept of plastic hinge uh, plastic collapse load load factor shear factor the different theorems of plastic collapse will be discussed methods of plastic analysis will also be considered later and of course uh, the design of uh, simple beams and more emphasis on the plastic analysis of continuous beams will be considered now as far as uh, this particular subject is concerned so vtu has recommended uh, the following two textbooks and of course uh, we also have quite a few reference books the first book is written by n subramanian design of steel structures limit state method is what the title published in 2016 by oxford university press new delhi the second book is written by s k dugal limit state design of steel structures magrahe education india private limited new delhi published in 2020 i request uh, the students to buy any one of these two books now as far as the reference books are concerned so we have the book written by dharatnam p title of the book is design of steel structures scientific international private limited the second book is by 
Kazmi and Sindon Design of Steel Structures, published by Fintis Hall of India, New Delhi. So, the entire subject is uh, being discussed with the help of uh, Code IS 800 2007, General Considerations, sorry, General Construction in Steel, Code of Practice, Third Revision, published by the Bureau of Indian Standard, New Delhi. Now, these are the two books uh, I was mentioning. The first one is by N. Subramaniam, Design of Steel Structures in the State Method. The second one is by S. K. Dubbar, Living State Design of Steel Structures. So, in addition to the textbooks, as I mentioned, we need uh, the basic code referred to as the Mother Code, IS 800, published in 2007. The title of the code is General Construction in Steel Code of Practice. So, sufficient copies uh, of these uh, codes are available in the libraries of the respective colleges and I also request all the students to buy one copy of the code so that uh, it can be used uh, as a part of analysis and design of this subject. So, in addition to the code, students uh, require a steel table where the properties of the different sections that are used in the construction of steel can be directly obtained. As far as this uh, steel table is concerned, we have uh, steel table books uh, written by different authors and here I am presenting uh, one book written by R. Agur. So this is indeed uh, a good steel table uh, book, so this can be referred. I request the students to purchase a copy of this steel table book as well. Now coming to the module 1, so let us see some of the important uh, steel structures and also the typical configurations of uh, the structure as a whole or even the different uh, components of the steel structure. In the left side, I have presented uh, different configurations of the trusses. As far as the trusses are concerned, you can use different materials. But here we will be using different sections of the steel to fabricate uh, these types of uh, steel trusses. And you can see one steel truss being fabricated and it is uh, taken to the position for the erection. Now here uh, I have a photograph where we will be able to see the fabrication of the steel frame using different uh, sections. Now here we will be seeing the vertical element. So this is what is referred to as the column in a steel frame and this is a closed section which is in the form of a tube and if you see at the top we have a series of lateral beams coming one going in the x direction and of course we also have one more series of beams going in the y direction and they are mutually perpendicular to each other so that's where orthogonal construction of the steel frame comes into picture now here the beams are connected by means of uh, boards and also you can see there is an angle here indian standard angle being used to connect uh, the different members of the beams coming in different directions. And also you can see two small plates here welded to the compression part of this particular beam. So that is to enhance the compressive strength of the flange. Otherwise uh, because of the slenderness of the web, uh, so there is every possibility that the element can undergo buckling. So in order to avoid that, the web need to be stiffened. Now for that, so these uh, two plates are being uh, provided especially near the location where the shear force is uh, substantial. And in the right photo, so you will be able to see one photograph of the bridge. So along the bridge you can see a railway track going. So this is uh, again the bridge over another railway track. And if you see this uh, bridge, it consists of uh, different sections of the steel. But if you see the horizontal section which acts like a girder, it appears to be like a plate girder where the plate is being stiffened by series of vertical stiffness. And we will be able to appreciate uh, many of these features so during the course of this particular subject. And once the course is being taught, we will be able to appreciate the importance of many of these structures and of course the structural components as well. Now let us see a few more typical configurations of uh, portal frame buildings. So this particular sketch uh, I have taken from the reference uh, N. Subramaniam, 
design of steel structures by the state method. So in all these uh, three frames, uh, so we'll be seeing the different types of eye sections being used. Now here we will be having uh, the vertical elements made out of uh, eye section. It is a tapered eye section acting as a column. And of course you also have tapered beams. So fabricated from eye sections or sometimes fabricated from the steel plates. So this is uh, a rigid tapered portal frame. Now coming to the second one. It is truss and cantilever column type of portal frame. And if you see the roof is uh, made of a roof truss and the roof truss is supported by two columns where column itself is uh, in the form of a truss. It's a open web type of roof truss. And also there is a provision for the crane assembly. So this is uh, what the crane assembly and we have the car that moves in the lateral direction and the entire crane assembly moves in the transfer direction of the building. So here the crane assembly is uh, supported by two deep beams. So this is uh, what the beam and sometimes uh, uh, the beam will be subjected to different types of forces and we also have a chapter connected with uh, the design of uh, this particular type of beam and this is referred to as a girder and in this particular case it is a gantry girder at its, as it is supporting the gantry bridge. So this is uh, another configuration uh, of the portal frame and it is a rigid portal frame more or less similar to the second one but in the second one so there is a roof truss as a covering material but here so we have a beam horizontal beam but not a tapered beam and of course the entire beam is supported on columns. So different configurations of the steel sections and uh, different uh, structural elements can be used to fabricate a portal frame. So in that sense a series of portal frames are being used to construct a steel building. So you can also see here uh, the different types of uh, multi-story buildings as far as the steel structures are concerned. The first one is a braced frame, the second one is a rigid frame, the third one is core and suspended floors. And you can also see a building consisting of series of sawtooth roof. And of course, uh, the next one is uh, a lattice girder. And the last one is uh, a space deck roof. So the idea of presenting uh, uh, this particular sketch uh, is to give an idea as to what different types of structures that can be constructed out of steel and what different elements of uh, steel that are required to be used uh, in the construction of these types of multi-story buildings. And of course, uh, these are the different types of domes and towers. So that can be constructed again from uh, different uh, steel sections and some configurations just to get a feel of what these uh, tall structures of steel is all about. And this is uh, how the different configurations of the multi-story building comes into picture as far as the height of the building is concerned it can vary from 20 story to something like 140 story so different configurations of the multi-story building you will be able to see here and in fact if you see this one so this is a 140 story height steel building so majority of the multi-story buildings today will be seeing constructed from rcc reinforced cement concrete but uh, in many situations, uh, even steel can also be used as a good material for the construction of multi-story buildings. Now coming to the introduction of this particular subject, the design of steel structures. If you see the title, we have three words coming into picture. One is the design, steel and structure. So let us see what these uh, three components or what is a structure if you ask the question the answer is anything that resist load and force can be called as a structure for example b slab column so these are all the elements you find in any building obviously these are referred to as structure in fact if you take other components such as fan table fan tree and even a human body is referred to as a structure or a structural component. A complex entity 
constructed of many parts uh, is sometimes referred to as uh, a structure and in this particular case it is referred to as a multi-story building or a multi-story structure. The bridge structure consisting of series of arches can also be considered as a structure. The manner of construction of something and the arrangement of its parts especially in case of building is also referred to as structure. And you must have heard of structural engineering. The person who takes up the responsibility of structural analysis and design. So it is a field of engineering mainly dealing with the analysis and design of structures that support or resist the loads. A particular type of load and different combinations of the loads are considered from the point of analysis and design. Structural engineering is usually considered a speciality within uh, civil engineering. In fact, we have steel structures, RCC structures, timber structure, pre-stressed concrete structures, aluminium structure, plastic structure, metal structure, masonry structure, depending on the type of the material being used for the construction. As far as the steel structural engineering is concerned, it mainly deals with uh, buildings uh, constructed out of steel, mainly from the point of analysis, design, fabrication and construction. What is structural analysis? So you must have studied uh, structural analysis in the earlier semester. Structural analysis 1, structural analysis 2 and uh, different chapters if you see, you will be able to make out what exactly we have done in that particular subject. Structural analysis incorporates the fields of mechanics and dynamics as well as many failure theories associated with the failure of structural components. From a theoretical perspective, the primary goal of structural analysis is the computation of deformations, internal forces and stresses in a structure. So this is what uh, we have studied uh, even in strength of material and of course uh, in a few chapters on structural analysis. In practice, structural analysis is a method to derive the engineering design process or prove the soundness of the design. Now what is structural design? It is a process by which a proper size and shape is given to the structure based on the type of the material used. Design of RCC structure or even design of steel structure. So in the design of uh, steel structures, you will be using steel as the basic material and an appropriate size and shape is given to the element by way of analysis and design. The structural design of a building must ensure that the building is able to stand up safely. That's very important. Able to function without excessive deflections or movements which may cause cracking or failure of fixtures, fittings or partitions or sometimes uh, discomfort for occupants. So many of these aspects are needed to be looked at by the structural engineer while executing the structural design. The structural design also must account for movements and forces due to temperature, creep and cracking. So these are referred to as the secondary effects and sometimes it is also referred to as the serviceability requirements from the point of design. It must also ensure that the design is practically buildable with an acceptable manufacturing tolerances of the material. So there is no point in simply designing a structure which is practically not feasible. So the practicality also going to be an important uh, factor to be looked at from the point of final analysis and design. What are the various responsibilities of a structural designer? The structural engineer is responsible for the following aspects, mainly from the point of design, and he has to give consideration to safety, serviceability, economy, and the alternatives as a part of design. As far as the safety is concerned, the structure does not fall down. So this is uh, one of the important requirement for any structure, whether it is an RCC structure, steel structure or any type of structure for that matter. 
Now, serviceability is the second uh, important point to be looked at. How well the structure performs in terms of appearance and deflection. So, these two concepts uh, are being covered in almost uh, every course of practices related to either the RCC design or even the steel design. The last two things, uh, economy and alternatives are also very important. The structure, what the designer is uh, proposing should be an efficient one where the use of material and labor is really efficient. Otherwise, uh, the structure will become uneconomic and also the elements uh, which are used in the design will not be that efficient. And we also need to come out with uh, several alternatives of the design so that uh, the best design can be finally selected uh, from the point of various requirements and of course from the point of economy. The next thing, what is steel as a structural material? The steel as you know it is an alloy of iron, a small amount of carbon being uh, put into at the time of manufacturing and it is widely used in the construction. The mechanical properties of the steel uh, is mainly governed by the carbon content and it varies over a wide range. The steel is basically iron and of course different alloy elements are being introduced. One of the most important uh, element uh, added at the time of manufacturing is the carbon. So carbon content plays an important role in determining the strength of the steel. Generally the carbon between 0.2% to 2.1% by weight is added depending on the grade of steel being manufactured. Carbon is the most uh, cost effective alloying material for iron but various other alloying elements are also used uh, such as manganese, chromium, vanadium and tungsten depending on the different properties uh, that are needed based on the application of steel and sometimes specific application of steel depending on the requirements. Now coming to the different types of steel, so we have the following uh, four types, carbon steels, alloy steels, tool steels and the stainless steels. Let us see what this uh, pure iron is all about. Of course uh, pure iron, it is very hard if you see and it appears to have good strength but from the engineering point of view the pure iron is very soft and of course it is ductile as well. So that is the reason so pure iron cannot be used as a structural material especially for the construction of buildings. So that is the reason we are looking for different types of steel by adding different alloy elements. The tensile strength of uh, a single crystal of pure iron is close to 28 megapascal and if you see 28 megapascal so this can be compared to the 28 day strength of a M20 or M25 concrete. So as far as uh, pure iron is concerned the strength is more or less comparable to that of uh, concrete. Of course the strength is really good from the point of the maximum strength what we are expecting in a structure this 28 is a very small value and also as a material iron is soft and ductile and hence it cannot be used. The moment you add 0.2% of carbon as an alloy element the tensile strength of the pure iron increases to 420 megapascal in that range. So that is what the importance of the addition of just 0.2% of carbon. Addition of carbon increases the tensile strength of the concrete substantially. If you increase the percentage of carbon, the tensile strength increases further but the rate of increasing tensile strength need not be proportional to the rate at which the carbon is added. But when you add about 0.8% of carbon, the tensile strength of the iron increases to something like 770 megapascal. So that is where the steel having a strength of 770 megapascal comes into picture. So that is what the importance of addition of carbon at the time of manufacturing of steel.
Now here I have uh, presented a table where we will be able to see the different types of steel and this particular table I have taken from the Google and this is recommended by AISI American Iron and Steel Institute standard. Now, of course uh, these types of steels are designated by some number as you can see here AISI 10, AISI 11, AISI 30 like that. The first one AISI 10 means it is a plain carbon steel and this particular steel consists of uh, 0.4 percent uh, manganese as one of the alloy element in addition to carbon. So we need to have carbon, carbon is one of the basic alloy element being added and in addition to carbon, so different types of alloy elements uh, can also be added uh, in order to modify many of the mechanical properties of the steel. Now as far as uh, AISI 13 is concerned, it is a high manganese steel. So in this particular steel, in addition to carbon, high percentage of manganese from 1.6 to 1.9 percent is being added. So like that, uh, one or two or more than two different alloy elements can also be added and thereby you will be able to get uh, different types of steel with different properties created to certain specific applications. What are all the mechanical properties of steel? So in fact uh, the entire analysis of uh, steel is based on the mechanical behavior of the steel as a material. The characterization of the mechanical properties can be done by conducting a tensile stress in the tensile test in the laboratory. So the mechanical properties of steel is uh, about linking the relationship between stress and strain. What happens when a particular uh, steel as an element is subjected to direct tension or direct compression? So in this particular case, uh, direct tensile force is applied uh, on a steel element and the behavior of the material is uh, characterized. So this type of characterization is referred to as a uniaxial characterization by conducting uniaxial stress strain experiment. Uniaxial stress strain experimental characterization is a very important thing to know what exactly the mechanical properties of steel as you increase the load from beginning to the failure. This behavior is inherent to material. It means uh, the behavior what I am going to explain now as stress strain characterization is unique uh, to most of the steel. It is not going to change from one steel to another steel. So that is the reason it is uh, an inherent property. Now if you really want to characterize uh, the stress strain diagram you need to have a specimen. The specimen is uh, looking something like this. You can also take uh, different types of specimen. So depending on the type of the gripping arrangement uh, is available in a universal testing machine. And of course uh, you can see the procedure by referring to Bureau of Indian Standard or any other standard. In fact uh, we have two concepts of uh, stress strain diagram which I will be discussing uh, in the subsequent slides. We have the engineering stress strain concept and also you have the true stress strain concept depending on what type of cross sectional area is being used from the point of stress calculation. So the engineering stress is referred to as the applied load divided by the cross sectional area A0. The cross sectional area A0 is the original undeformed cross sectional area of the section. So what initial cross sectional area if that is considered for the calculation of the stress till the material fails and what the stress strain diagram you are going to get with that is referred to as the engineering stress strain diagram. So you can also determine the true stress as the load applied divided by the deformed cross sectional area. So as you apply the load, the specimen undergo elongation, the cross sectional area of the specimen decreases and at a particular value of the load, instead of calculating the stress as a function of the original area, if, to, if you take the stress corresponding to that level of a load, then the stress what you are going to get is referred to as the true stress 
at that level of load. Like that, if we collected the stress till failure, taking the cross-sectional area at that level of stress and then draw the stress strain diagram, then it is referred to as the true stress strain diagram. So you will be able to see both the stress strain diagrams in the stress strain curve. Now this is what uh, the testing setup. So universal testing machine, you must have seen this type of testing machine in strength of materials laboratory. And you also must have done some experiment when you were in second semester. So this is uh, another type of uh, specimen that can be considered. So it is a circular specimen. So this is the central portion where we will be measuring the deformation. And of course uh, near the end where the specimen is connected to the machine. So the diameter is uh, somewhat larger. But the specimen where the information is recorded in the form of stress and strain, the cross section is uh, reduced and you will be determining the deformation over certain length being referred to as the gauge length. So L0 is uh, referred to as the gauge length. And of course, if you see the section here, the junction where you have different cross section, a small transitional change in the diameter comes into picture in order to ensure the failure of the section not happening at this location. Otherwise, because of the concentration of the stress, there is a very possibility when the specimen fails, instead of failing somewhere near the center, it may even fail at the junction. So to avoid uh, the concentration of the stress, a transitional increase in the diameter is ensured from smaller diameter to the larger diameter so that the stress concentration effect can be reduced and we can ensure that the failure is happening somewhere near the center where the actual be behavior is being recorded. Now since it is a mild state, you know at the time of uh, failure a neck is going to form and because of this necking the cross sectional area of the specimen decreases and at some cross sectional area where the applied load and the resistance exceeds the capacity of the specimen, the specimen fails. So in this particular case, the nature of the failure of the mild steel in tension is cup and cone fracture type. Now as far as uh, the ductile or brittle material is concerned, so we need to define uh, certain factors so in order to understand uh, the stress strain behavior. So as far as the ductile materials are concerned, you know the material undergoes a large strain or large deformation, substantial deformation before the rupture happens. The two measures are being used to measure the ductility of the structure. One is the percentage of elongation. The percentage of elongation over the gauge length is defined by this particular formula. So the enlarged length because of the deformation minus the initial length being L0. So that is the change in deformation divided by the original deformation. And that change as a percentage is referred to as percent elongation. Now as far as the mild steel is concerned, this percent elongation can be as large as 20% and it can even go up to 40%. For mild steel, as I mentioned, 25 to 35 percent is generally being recorded in many of the tests. Percentage reduction in area is uh, being uh, defined by this particular formula. In the same way as percentage of elongation, so the percentage reduction in area is defined like this. So this is the original cross-sectional area which is larger and this is the cross-sectional area near the necking part. And this difference is uh, the actual reduction in area, but compared to the original area and as a percentage, so we will be able to calculate what is the percentage reduction in area. And for mild steel, so this percentage reduction in area can be as high as 60%. So let us see one typical uh, stress strain diagram. So this is uh, what the behavior. Uh, you are going to get when you conduct a tension test uh, in the laboratory. Now kindly see the two parameters uh, considered uh, in this stress strain diagram. So in the vertical axis we will be recording the 
stresses and in the horizontal direction so we will be recording the strain so that is the reason it is referred to as stress strain diagram in fact we have different zones that can be considered in this stress strain diagram one is the elastic region where the behavior is elastic in nature and we have a complete yielding zone or the yielding region the second one the third one is referred to as the strain hardening region the fourth one is referred to as the necking region and all these regions as you see they are available under the stress strain diagram as i mentioned we have two different types of stress strain diagram the first one is the engineering stress strain diagram so the engineering stress strain diagram in the elastic region then in the yielding region and of course in the strain hardening and as well as in the necking region so this is what the engineering stress strain diagram you will be seeing in many of the textbooks so this is plotted based on the initial cross sectional area of the specimen and if you see there is one more diagram and you will be able to see the diagram starting from this particular point that is what is referred to as the strain hardening point so from this point if you see there is a substantial difference between the engineering stress strain diagram and the true stress strain diagram any point on this diagram repre represent the stress corresponding to that level of a load the corresponding stress is referred to as the true stress or the stress corresponding to the cross sectional area at that level of loading and kindly say this is the point where the specimen fails by fracture so this is what is referred to as the true fracture stress which is substantially higher compared to the fracture stress which is calculated based on the original cross sectional area so original cross sectional area is uh, constant and of course it is more compared to the cross sectional area at the time of failure the area corresponding to the necking part so there is a substantial difference between the fracture stress based on the engineering stress to the true stress now kindly see here the initial stress strain diagram in the elastic zone it is more or less constant as far as the true stress strain diagram or even the engineering stress strain diagram is concerned so even the horizontal plateau is more or less constant for both the stress strain diagram the change in the cross sectional area is not substantial it is more or less same even though there is a small change in the cross sectional area happening so from the practical point of view the actual cross sectional area and the cross sectional area that is changed at that level of a load is more or less comparable so that is the reason the actual stress strain diagram and the engineering stress strain diagram as far as the initial two regions of the behavior is concerned is more or less same now if you see in the initial region the stress is directly proportional to strain so that is the reason where we have the linear behavior the stress strain diagram is linear stress is proportional to strain and of course the behavior is not only linear the behavior is elastic in nature if you release the stress at any level of loading the material come back to its original position now if you see this is the point where the linearity of the stress and strain ceases so this is the maximum value of the stress at which the limit of proportionality comes into picture from this point onwards the behavior of the material is slightly non linear but still it is elastic and that is where so we have the first point so this is the point that is considered as the elastic limit point or the stress corresponding to the onset of the plastic behavior now from that point so the behavior will become slightly non linear and just a small change in the behavior will be seen in this particular location where the behavior is uh, non linear 
but it is uh, not elastic. Now this is the point uh, at which the material starts to yield completely. So this is uh, where the continuous yielding of the material you are going to see. So this is the stress strain diagram where you are not seeing the upper and lower yield point. But in many a situation you will be having not only the upper yield point but also the lower yield point which you will be seeing in the next diagram. Now kindly see this particular point being referred to as the strain hardening point. So from that particular point if you see the rate of deformation of the specimen is more compared to the similar rate of deformation that happens in the initial stage of loading. So in the initial stages of loading the deformation is uh, very small. If you want to cause additional deformation we need to apply additional load. A similar type of behavior exists in the strain hardening zone but the rate of deformation is more for a particular rate of loading. But the relationship between the stress and strain will become non-linear. So that is the only difference uh, as far as the strain hardening part is concerned compared to the initial elastic part is considered. Whatever that happens in the elastic region that can be recovered. But unfortunately whatever that happens in the yielding portion or either in the strain hardening portion or in the necking portion cannot be recovered. So that is the reason the material has undergone substantial plastic deformation where anything that happens in the form of a change, change in the length and change in cross section that cannot be recovered. So this is uh, where the complete behavior of the stress strain diagram of the mild steel comes into picture. Now coming to the elastic analysis and design my dear friends, the initial elastic behavior where the stress is directly proportional to strain. So only this particular portion of the behavior is considered in the elastic method of design which we will be discussing later. Now in plastic method of analysis we need the initial elastic behavior and also we need certain length of the plastic behavior. So this linearly elastic behavior and this constant yielding part both will be considered in the plastic method of analysis as far as steel is concerned. So the elastic region and also the yielding region both are needed in plastic method of structure analysis. What is important in plastic analysis of steel structure is this uh, continuous yielding. So the material should undergo continuous yielding over certain length. So if you calculate the strain corresponding to the yield point, if that is referred to as epsilon, the material should undergo at least 3 to 4 times of uh, that deformation as a continuous yielding so that that particular steel can be used for the plastic method of analysis and design. The material has to undergo continuous deformation once the yielding of the cross section has started. So that is where the continuous yielding plays a very important role in the plastic method of steel structures which we will be discussing uh, in greater details in the subsequent topics. Now this is uh, another diagram which again represents the stress strain behavior of steel. This is uh, more or less similar to the previous diagram but this is uh, plotted uh, more or less to the actual scale. So this is where the stress varies from 0 goes up to about 450 so that's what you are seeing in the vertical directions and in the horizontal direction you are seeing the strain and kindly see this is the point at which the linearity of the stress and strain ceases. So that's where the proportionality limit comes into picture or the proportionality point or the proportionality stress. Now kindly say this particular point is uh, referred to as the upper yield point that is the maximum point uh, where the stress has gone and at from that particular point uh, if you try to increase the load further instead of the stress increasing so there is a small drop in the stress that happens that is where we have the lower yield point. Now from the lower yield point uh, we will be seeing a continuous deformation happening a continuous yielding of the material happening and that is what is uh, referred to as uh, the continuous yielding and of course we have 
the remaining behavior as we have seen in the previous diagram. But in this particular diagram, I am showing not only the upper yield point, even the lower yield point. So in order to understand the complete details of what really happens at the time of yielding, I have shown the stress strain diagram to a larger scale. So that can be seen in the second graph, where the vertical scale corresponding to stress is same. But if you see, the horizontal scale is uh, made different. If you see the original diagram corresponding to the yielding point, we have a strain something close to 0.004 to 0.005. So that particular behavior up to 0.004 to 0.005 is being uh, enlarged. I am going from 0.001 to 0.004 at the rate of 0.001. And this is what the linear behavior and kindly see the point up to which the stress strain behavior is linear. So this particular point is referred to as the proportionality point and of course at any level of stress if you release the load the material will come back to the original position and thereby the material is behaving elastically up to point of proportionality. From the point of proportionality over certain length, the behavior will become non-linear, but still the material behaves elastically and later the behavior is non-linear, but the behavior is more or less plastic in nature. Upper yield point, the maximum stress corresponding to yielding and then the lower yield point and then the horizontal plateau. So this horizontal plateau plays a very important role in plastic method of structural analysis and this horizontal length should be 4 to 5 times compared to the strain corresponding to the elastic behavior. The strain corresponding to the elastic behavior if you take it as uh, epsilon 1, so definitely you should have 3 to 4 times of the deformation happening as a horizontal plateau. So that plays an important role and that ensures the continuous deformation of the steel and that is what is referred to as the rotation of the plastic hinge in plastic method of structural analysis. Now kindly see the plastic behavior of the aluminium. Of course aluminium is also an elastic material. The stress strain behavior is uh, linear in the initial stages as you can see here. Then it becomes non-linear and it increases continuously. Compared to steel in aluminium there is no continuous deformation of the material. At a particular level of stress, the continuous yielding of the material is not being seen. For each and every increment of load, there is an increment of deformation. Stress and strain keep on increases. At a constant stress, continuous straining or the continuous deformation is not seen in aluminium. So the aluminium is lacking the horizontal plateau corresponding to continuous yielding and hence plastic analysis is not applicable to aluminium as a structural material. And kindly see the stress corresponding to 0 0.002, 0.2 percent of strain and if you draw a line parallel to the initial behavior of the stress strain diagram or the initial portion of the stress strain diagram and extend it till it touches the curve and you get a point and that point corresponding to the yielding and that is where the yield stress and the corresponding yield strain will be able to get. So in this case of aluminium the yield strain is uh, very close to 0 0.006 and to get this 0 0.006 the total strain we need the concept of uh, this 0.2% of proof strain. So this is referred to as 0.2% of proof strain. Corresponding to that, we need to draw a line corresponding to line which is parallel to the initial part of the stress strain behavior so that it touches the stress strain diagram and that is the point that gives you the yield stress and the total yield strain of the material. And kindly see the effect of the carbon content. As I mentioned, as the carbon content is uh, increased, the ultimate strength of the steel also increases.
the yield strength of the steel also increases. So 0.1%, 0.2%, 0.6% like that the carbon content is increased but kindly see how the strength of the material is increasing. So the initial behavior of the material is uh, more or less constant because the constant of proportionality being referred to as the modulus of elasticity is constant for any type of steel. So that is the reason the initial stress strain diagram is straight and later the non-linearity starts depending on the type of the steel and the percentage of carbon content. Now let us see the behavior of uh, steel in compression. For that we will be considering a very small specimen having a certain diameter and height where the height to diameter ratio generally kept less than about 2. So when you conduct an experiment on this uh, small piece of uh, mild steel in compression, uniaxial compression, the behavior what you are going to get is more or less similar to the behavior what you get in tension test. For the first two portions of elastic region and the plastic region, the behavior is more or less constant, but the region third and the fourth where you have the strain hardening and strain softening, so those two behaviors will be different in case of compression. Now if you see the nature of the stress strain diagram, it looks something like this. So this is what happens in uh, tension and this is uh, what is being plotted in compression. The material considered is a grey cast iron and if you see the initial portion of the stress strain diagram, it is more or less uh, linear and then it has become non-linear and the stress and strain keep on increases unlike in tension where we have a softening part and that softening part is not observed in case of compression. So this is mainly due to increase in cross-sectional area as you increase the load and also the resistance to the material keep on increases and of course with additional deformation. The deformation of the strain keep on increases and the resistance of the material also keep on increases. So this is uh, what the behavior of a grey cast iron in compression. So I have not shown the complete behavior in tension. The behavior in tension and behavior in compression as far as steel is concerned is more or less comparable. So that is what uh, the important point uh, the student need to remember. Now if you take concrete uh, subjected to compression, the behavior will be completely non-linear and this is what the behavior you must have seen uh, in the analysis and design of uh, RCC structure and this is what is being referred uh, to as uh, the stress strain diagram in IS 4.6-2000 also. So this is what the diagram considered in the analysis and design of RCC structure. The maximum uh, stress is something uh, around 35 megapascal. Maybe it is for M30 grade concrete and this is what the strain is. And if you see corresponding to the maximum stress, uh, the strain is very close to 0 0.002. So that is where 0.2% being the maximum strain corresponding to the compression failure where the compressive stress is close to 35 megapascal and the strain corresponding to 0.2% or 0 0.002 as a value. So the entire behavior if you see it is non-linear and once the maximum load is reached so the load resisting capacity of the concrete decreases at some point the material faced by fracture. So this is what the behavior of concrete considered in the design of RCC. Now kindly see from the stress strain diagram we will be able to come out with one law referred to as the Hooke's law. So it is a law which is well known to all the engineers and this is applicable to the linear part of the stress strain diagram wherein the stress is directly proportional to strain. So that is the reason sigma is equal to E into epsilon. Sigma is the stress, epsilon is the strain and the constant of proportionality is referred to as the modulus of elasticity or the Young's modulus. As long as the relationship is linear, 
the modulus of elasticity is referred to as the Young's modulus. And this is first uh, proposed by Thomas Young in uh, 1807. And there is a reason this modulus is referred to as the Young's modulus. And Young's modulus is simply the ratio of stress to strain corresponding to any point along the uh, linear part of the stress strain behavior. So typically the modulus of elasticity is equal to 200 and GPA gigapascal as far as steel is concerned and it is constant for most of the steel. It is 2.1 into 10 to the power of 5 megapascal nothing but Newton per mm square. So this 210 when you test in aluminium you get a typical value equal to 70 gigapascal. So when you compare this 70 gigapascal to 210 gigapascal the elasticity, the modulus of elasticity of aluminium is almost one third compared to the modulus of elasticity of steel. So if you have a beam made of steel subjected to certain load and when you take a similar type of beam made of uh, aluminium, so for a particular load or a particular span, the aluminium will undergo deformation, the deflection which is three times, exactly three times compared to the deflection the steel beam undergoes. So that is the reason we have a great concern when you start using uh, this aluminium as a structural material. So the deformation of the aluminium will be more. The deflection of the aluminium as a uh, beam or even as a member is substantially higher. In fact, it is three times higher compared to steel. So that is the reason uh, this particular aluminium is not being uh, considered as a suitable structural material for practical applications. So with this, uh, I will stop this uh, first session. So thank you very much for uh, listening and if you have any questions, you can ask. Thank you very much.